Good afternoon, everyone. We really want to make this an insightful session. So we want you to get out of here inspired and really know what you want to do to make an impact on this world, right? So um, welcome to this session, anyone who's tuning in online and all of you in the room. So very quickly about me, um, I am Mark Alain Boussico. I am from Haiti. I'm a former coordinating ambassador. Um, but I'm very passionate about technology and building ecosystems. So my job is really to match talent mm -hmm. to the resources we need to make a difference in this world. And I'm currently at the Harvard Kennedy School learning how to be a better public servant. So I am joined today by two fantastic, amazing leaders. Um, and if you want to talk about authentic activism, who better than those two amazing ladies here? Um, Halima, who's uh, a model who's been leveraging her platform to make a difference, and also Jamira, who you heard on stage on the first day, really, we should not silence, we should put things out there. Very yeah. inspiring. Um, I'm gonna just start with you, Alima, very quickly. Um, you know, what would be your advice for young people who are like trying to figure out how to get involved, what they should be involved in, how they should leverage their platform? What would you tell them? Great question. And before I answer that, I just want to quickly thank everybody for being here. And um, this is important conversations to have. I would say find a cause that's close to your heart. Good. You know, sometimes when we try to force things, it's it's going to quickly, like you're going to have burnout, the passion is going to be gone, it's just going to feel like it's misaligned. So whatever it is, you know, if you're passionate about the environment, go in that direction. You know, find the NGOs, the communities, the grassroots causes that are working towards that. If you're passionate about refugees and migrations, have family members that are from the refugee community or yourself a refugee, I think that is a great cause to also support. So. Keep it simple, find the right organization that really, you should feel inspired, mm -hmm. you know? You should have the fire. Yeah. That is how you know that you found the right cause, you know? When you keep thinking about it over and over again, like I wake up sometimes at 3 a.m. and I have ideas about like what we can do to invite refugees to the table, but it's because it's so near to my heart. Yeah. I was a child refugee seven years of my life in one of the largest camps, and believe it or not, I wouldn't change it for the world. It brought 14 different countries, refugees from over 14 different countries to this camp in the most remote, remote part of Kenya. And it was a vibrant community. It was 66% women and children. Wow. So as you can imagine, very, very nurturing. Mm -hmm. And so that was a natural cause for me. But I'll be honest with you guys. I embarked on this journey when I was 19. I had the fire, I had the passion, <laughs> I came in swinging. Awesome. Yeah. And I quickly realized, oh my goodness, I have so much childhood trauma to unpack, mm -hmm. not necessarily from the camp, yeah. but just imagine, you know, you're a child, you're born there. You don't know that you're a refugee. You don't know about the legal system. All you know is Kakuma is home. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're taken away from that environment to seek a better life, but you don't understand that. Your parents don't explain it to you. And so we went from Kakuma to um, the settlement in Nairobi and then St. Louis and then Minnesota. And so it was a lot wow. of movements and it felt like as soon as I found a place to call home, up and move. And so now as like an adult, 24 years old, I find mm -hmm. it hard to know what home is. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I can see a lot of eyes are like shining. I want to really give like five minutes for questions at least. So we have 20 minutes together. So I'm going to jump right away to you, Jamira. So I'm sure you went through that process as well. Yeah. But when you find a cause, when you see what you should be engaged in, how do you convert that into concrete impact action? Mm -hmm. What would be your step advice yeah. to kind of convert that energy into action? Thank you for that question. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, good. Um, first of all, I'm excited to be on this panel because I fangirl over the both of you. Um, so I'm super honored to be in conversation Thank with you. you. And the first thing I would say, you know, to compliment with uh, Halima has already um, eloquently um, conveyed to you is to think about the things that you need to learn and unlearn. 
We all grew up in a world where our view of the world is so skewed by our upbringing, by the things that people told us, things that people we trust have told us, right? And as we get older, we are exposed to more communities, to more lived experiences, and to really information that makes us question the things that we've been told our entire life. And so one of the concrete things that I think you need to do before you start creating any sort of organization or any sort of activation is really learn about communities other than your own. Mm -hmm. um, to really understand the experiences that other people are existing within and how rules, regulations, and systems have played a role in putting blockers on their upward mobility. I think until you can really get close to how other people are experiencing the same institutions, the same communities as you, you're never gonna be fully able to create programs and opportunities that alleviates those barriers. Mm -hmm. um, so think about learning, and then unlearn all of the biases you've been told about other mm -hmm. communities. And that could have been intentional or unintentional, right? I'm a reality TV girl. Real Housewives is my thing. Oh. Um, <laughs> but for people around the world who may never have come in contact with black women or never have come in contact with another community than the one that they, they, they look like, um, it's very easy to see something on TV and assume that's how everyone who looks like that is who they are. Mm -hmm. And so um, take a moment, unlearn those biases, and really start to question how you show up in the world and the actions, the things that you say that may actually cause harm to other communities. Absolutely, absolutely. Jamira, let me, Thank you. let me just, yeah, that deserves a clap. Learn to unlearn. So, Jamira, you've been using your platform as a really big conveyor and, you know, putting messages out there for people and also communicating and bringing people together. Um, digital activism is actually sometimes criticized, as in, yeah. you know, it lacks of content or it lacks of consistency or really real impact. How would you react to that as a person who chose to leave that way and to make a difference like that. Do you think that's true? Well, I think technology plays a huge mm -hmm. role. How many of you guys are on TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are too smart for that. <laughs> you guys are on LinkedIn. This is the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> they have secret TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> But I think technology, and especially social media, mm -hmm. it brings this authentic transparent transparency mm -hmm. where in an instant we could all have our opinion, good and bad, right? But it just, it connects us to have these honest conversations. And I just, even stepping away from social media, what I want to see in refugee camps is no more food rations. I mean, that's important. People don't want to. But we should also allocate resources mm -hmm. and um, money into bringing technology into refugee camps. Yeah. Why can't we bring computer labs yep. to camps? Why yeah. can't we give these children access to a smart board so they could be connected to what our children in America mm -hmm. yeah. get to learn, you know? Totally. So I think it's absolutely important and it drives change. And even you guys, like I see the phones out. I hope you guys are all sharing, tagging One Young World, tag Mark. And so this is a great way to just keep the message going. And everybody in this room, whether you have 10 followers or 20 million followers, it's equally important because yeah. you're doing the hard work. That is an important message. Yeah. Your community is how you connect with the people who follow your dreams mm -hmm. and who, are, who believe in what you're doing. And that's how you get people moving. Mm -hmm. um, talking about community and bringing people together, Jamira, I just want to really go back to you. Um, how important or how can we as young leaders collaborate more with each other, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Across sectors in different countries, have, how do you explore that alley and how would you advise everyone here on collaborating better for bigger impact? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and actually, I think it's tied into technology. Yeah. Um, it's tied into social media. Um, we are at a time where we can get connected with folks around the world like we've never seen before. Yeah. Right? When we saw what, what was happening in Tokyo, you have folks that were in New York protesting. When we saw the Black Lives Matter movement, we saw similar, organi I mean, similar protests happening in other parts of the world. Um, and I think technology has created br bridges for us to be able to not only learn about the struggles of other communities, but also find ways in which we can uplift those stories 
to the powers that be and put that political pressure, that social pressure on them to actually make substantial changes. And so that's why I believe in collaboration is so important because um, you, your voice, your, your platform has the ability to open the door for more people to learn about the struggles of other communities, but also just to become more informed. Um, when we think about the disabled community or the um, d differently abled community, um, if you look at TikTok, they're using TikTok in a way to really inform people around the different ways in which technology, around in-person events or in-person activities actually put barriers in their ability to participate. So this space right now, um, if you look across who's in the room, I think it's really important to find out who also is working on the topic that you care about, right? Yeah. So if you think about education or you think climate change, all of those issues supersedes borders. So our identities, our countries oftentimes keep us within borders, but these issues are so much bigger yeah. than the borders that we call home. So you know, find out who shares your interests around particular issues and then think about the ways in which, one, you can educate each other about how that particular issue looks different in your home country, but then also are there ways that we can use our, our leverage, our joint leverage, to put pressure on um, institutions to be able to create change. Prime example. In 2012, I was asked to be a part of the UN Global Education First Initiative. 15 young people from 15 different countries. Our job was to raise awareness about the need for quality education for some of the world's most marginalized communities. And that's how I learned about what was happening in Australia to indigenous young people. And that's how I learned, hey. right? Like, awesome. that's how I learned about um, transgender community in the Philippines, right? I would have never been exposed to those lived experiences. And because of that, it has informed how I show up for those communities. So even if you don't, pick up that issue, you can now advocate in a way that you never would have been able to advocate before because it allows you to do no harm. Mm -hmm. Do no harm is one of the biggest ways that you can show up as an advocate, and that requires you to learn about how other people are impacted about the issues that you advocate for. Jesus Christ. A round of applause. That's really amazing, amazing work. I really would like to get into questions, so I'm going to just ask one last question to both of you, and then I'm going to open it to Q&A real quick. And I see all the eyes, and you guys want to participate into this. Um, we showed all the beauty of it and how yeah. the, all the good stuff about it. But I think also being an activist is also, it costs your health, your mental health, your physical health sometimes. How do you both ladies stay healthy? And what would your advice be to all of those in the room who are looking up to you? Well, I'd like to hear it from you. Yeah. Um, it's so funny. I, I was, um, I feel like I'm about to cry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, I think social media has made us believe that being in activism is sexy. It's yeah. cool. It's fun. And it is. Um, but if you are someone who deeply cares about the lived experiences of other people, um, I am an empath. Um, so when I see things that are happening right now in India, right, you have, or in Pakistan, like people who are underwater, um, people who are suffering. Um, I'm deeply connected to that, and I think that being an activist is definitely, there are some opportunities that arise, but the emotional toll that it takes on you um, is something that you have to constantly monitor, and you have to be able to advocate for yourself in that, progress, in that process. So I would say one of the things that I try to maintain is a level of um, grounding with my friends. And I think that's why it's so important to be a part of a community, a circle of friends who yeah. not only care about the things that you care about, but also can find moments of joy and laughter and fun. Um, because the world is, we're in a very um, sad place, but I also think it's a moment of opportunity for us to be able to raise the alarm bells um, to find the change that we need and we seek. But at the same time, um, opposi our opposition wins when it tires us out. Right when it makes us weak, when it makes us forget how we need to keep ourselves strong and healthy and powerful. So don't forget to take care of yourself as you're taking care of other people. Absolutely. Yeah. How, do you know? how do you do it? I mean, I might not be the right person to answer this because to be honest with you guys, I'm still figuring it out. You know, wow. I've been in therapy, I'm so proud to say 11 months. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Therapy is important. <laughs> Which is a big deal because I used to like literally make myself so busy running around doing a million projects oh. just so I did not have to deal with my own trauma. Yeah. And so the way I kind of healed is through trauma bonding. And you know, like I really healed through working with refugee women. But the babies, 
it was a little too close to home. So mm -hmm. I actually stepped back from the NGO community because of that yeah. very reason that you brought up, the emotional toll that it brings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like, especially as young people, mm -hmm. sometimes we forget to put ourselves, yep. you know, on the same, like, level of care as we would to the people that we're trying to empower. We feel guilty. Yeah, and, and survival's guilt mm -hmm. because my family was among the... 1% of refugees that got to resettle to a developed country like America. And so it's tremendous like imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. like there's a million kids that are more talented, more resilient, have like mm -hmm. just heroic story, uh, like backgrounds and they have inspiring stories. But I got lucky, you know, I was given that opportunity. So now it's about passing the mic and yeah. stepping off that stage and giving the spot spotlight to people who need to share new stories because I've already shared my story. Yeah. I've only lived in the camp seven <laughs> years and there's people who are still in the camp 30 years. So I feel like their stories are even more important because it's current, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes like as, you know, public figures, it's like our stories like tokenized. Yep. But the reality is, it's not a, it's not a hashtag. It's not a yeah. campaign for social media. This is real life. This yeah. is a matter of life or death. And so sometimes our young generation, we try so hard to give back. We're so quick to post. We're so quick to change our Instagram profile to red, mm -hmm. to blue, to, and it's like, what is that doing? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's so performative. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I hope we can step away from that and really just empower everybody. And I'm not saying that you have to be a refugee, like everybody could come together. In fact, that's what it needs. It needs a diverse group of people, people even who've never lived in a camp, but who can empathize, mm -hmm. who go to the camps, who volunteer, who make the friendships. I think sometimes with activism, yeah. It should be fun because there's so many resilient stories. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be so heavy.